right, we'll slowly get started. Thank you everyone for making it at the second day of Link Forward. Um, we're gonna start with a keynote by Ted Dunning. We, we are very fortunate uh, to have Ted here this year. Ted is the Chief Applications Architect at MAPAR. He's also the VP of Apache Incubator. Uh, Ted has been doing open source for many, many, many years and 20, 40, 40. Oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, and among the many things that, that he has done in open source is that he was a mentor of Flink uh, when Flink was in incubation. Um, just one quick announcement before we start. Um, we unfortunately had a last minute cancellation for today. So the talk that is at that should have been at 4 p.m. at uh, Kino 6 by Amazon Web Services is not going to happen. Uh, so both of these guys felt really sick. So let's let's send them some happy thoughts. Instead of that, uh, Stefan even will host a birds of a feather session on Stream SQL. So if you are interested in participating in an open discussion on Stream SQL, uh, you can join that one. All right, Ted, all yours. So I'm going to talk about how we can actually take Flink to the next step. But I'm going to talk first a little bit about what the step next step might be. What is at stake? Where we could go? As Costa said, I'm Ted Dunning. I work at MapR. Normally wear red, but it's too hot. And I also work with Apache a fair bit. Now, I may need to rely on my laryngitis interpreter here. We'll find out how it goes. I'd also like to mention that Costas and Ellen have written a book recently on Flink. It's not yet available in hard copy, but it is available electronically. So I'm going to talk about what's happening right now in computing. And it's only happened a few times ever before. Businesses right now are changing over. Even if they seem to be completely physical businesses, they're changing over to be completely digital. This is a huge change. This is causing a re-implementation of essentially all enterprise software. And that's only happened very roughly twice. And over history, there have only been a few events comparable to this. The invention of accounting in either Minoan culture or Sumerian culture, it's hard to tell which. Indic numbers, nice data representation. Uh, banking by letter of credit. That was a huge invention. Open source data in the 19th century. People think it was a recent invention. No, it was older. Electronic automation at all. Relational systems, the internet, and now what's happening right now. Early accounting, for instance, was the first time things became virtualized. This tablet here talks about the amounts of grain that were in a warehouse. And so that tablet stood for, it symbolized that grain that was in the warehouse. That was the first time that things had an information representation. Uh, this, by the way, is in Greece. I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, accounting was a very major innovation. Letters of credit were the first time a country was destroyed by software. Letters of credit were apparently first used by the Knights of Templar around the year 1200. What would happen is people who were going on crusade would give all of their possessions to the Knights, who would give them a letter saying they had received such and so value. And then there was an entire uh, network of Knights across the Middle East where you could go there and they would scratch out part of the value and give you something so that you could survive while you're off crusading. This is transformed more modernly into the Middle Eastern Halawa banking system. And when the Italians adopted letter of credit banking, they were able to transfer value from city to city with just a piece of paper. And the Hansa League, at that, at that time in the 13 and 1400s, the dominant trade entity across Northern Europe was essentially a country. They had a Congress in Lubeck was destroyed by this because they insisted on moving silver. So since they had to move silver that was of equal bulk of the commodities, they had twice the shipping costs. 
No free shipping back then. And they were destroyed by this. They were unable to compete, and within 150 years, they were completely gone. The first open source data project that I know about was Matthew Morey's creating of maps which shared data between mariners. It cut the times for sailing between New York and San Francisco roughly in half. Made massive differences to the number of people dying, basically because you could have a recommendation engine that said people who sailed here got this weather. And by sharing that information, making the same available information available widely, it was an enormous thing. And it was an open source project. You could get the charts for free if you contributed data. So now we're going through a comparable revolution. This revolution is where information itself is becoming the thing of value. Just like the letters of credit stood for money, just like the accounting tablets stood for commodities, information abstractly now has a value even though it doesn't necessarily stand for something. Companies can get more value from data that you and I generate just by existing, just by talking, just by being late to a presentation. They get more value than we can get from our own data. And this is structural, not optional. If you look at the top 10 companies in the world by valuation, notice that three of them are essentially pure information companies. It's the first time in history that pure information has had that much value. And three others are effectively transmuting data and getting the value out of it. You can argue that Apple is not necessarily a purveyor of hardware. They don't make it. They often don't sell it, and it's only access to information that the, the hardware device does. And so they're essentially a virtual company. Data has value in the aggregate, and it has value in the moment. <coughs> and neither of those are things that humans can access, neither of those values, nor can we easily pass that value to each other. The aggregate information that we all have in this room is something that exists, but none of us in isolation have it. This was the lesson of those maps, that aggregated data had the value, but the isolated data did not. Also, another reason we can't deal with this is the data is just flat out big. So we have to talk about the details of what these revolutions are doing, how they're happening, what's going on, and how it's changing social structure, how it's changing compute structure, before we can understand the role of Flink in this. The first revolution is that, frankly, big data is better than little data. There was a paper back in the early 2000s, late 1990s. Um, who was it? Uh, Brill was one of the authors. I forget the other. But they showed that just increasing data size made a bigger difference to the particular natural language problem that they were working on than any algorithmic choice they could make. The horizontal axis here is scale, and as they increase scale by two or three orders of magnitude, improve, the improvement in performance was large. And you can see that band of different results. Those are the differences they were able to achieve just using changes of algorithms. So the scale made a much bigger difference than choice of algorithms. And this is still true. A friend of mine defeated a very large attack on banks in the US a few years ago purely because he stored all the headers for all the transactions that came to his bank. By having more data, he was able to find a trivial countermeasure that completely defeated the attack. And it would have been impossible for him. So it wouldn't have been just better as it was with Eric Brill's work, it would have been impossible without the big data. So big really is making a difference. Credit card fraud detection works because of data pooling. Speech recognition works because we all talk in many different ways that can be sampled and used as training data. Image analysis is working because people are putting hundreds of millions of images on the internet in ways that can be used for training data. Digital marketing 
works because of scale, not because of cleverness. I mean, the cleverness is there, but it wouldn't work without the scale. So second revolution is how we can actually build these systems. The ways we can build these systems are changing dramatically. It's not just large monolithic systems as it once was a very long time ago. At the time when people had these very large monolithic systems, the development of them was stratified essentially by class and gender. If you were a female, you did key punch data entry. If you were male without a degree, you did operations. If you were male with a degree, you became a system analyst or programmer. This made in-tier architectures a natural evolution where the social structures led to technical divisions in the software. The most important and salient thing is these horizontal divisions. As the systems got larger and you wound up with multiple systems, the horizontal divisions remained. People did not talk up and down the stack, and they more and more didn't even talk sideways, although that was more permeable than vertically. This led to systems that were very hard to change because they, they shared common assumptions to the extent that the data people, the storage people talked and standardized, that froze the upper layers because it exposed implementation. Same thing is true for databases. This has changed radically very recently. The idea here is that microservices start with a vertical division, a vertical social division between teams and allow perfect communication up and down. This breaks down the divisions between different layers in the stack, lets people talk to each other, lets Java programmers write queries, lets front-end people do some logic, and it results in systems that work much better, partly because the vertical divisions are abstraction barriers, and so the individual vertical stacks are free to implement. Again, it's the division shape that's the most interesting thing, and the most interesting concept here is that those vertical stacks become opaque entities. Opaque in the sense that they communicate with each other, but they can be re-implemented ad libitum. This is called microservices. I don't want to go in too much into that, but this is in many ways the core of this re-implementation that's going on. The value of big data would not be accessible without modern implementation techniques. The results of this can be astonishing. All of the big Silicon Valley companies that you've heard of that are known as groundbreaking use techniques very similar to this. Many of the ones that you haven't heard of, you haven't heard of because they didn't. A few of the ones that don't and are still prominent, like Yahoo, have predictable evolution from now. Now, much of the discussion around microservices talks about these systems that have call and response remote procedure call sort of semantics, where you make a request and you get a response and all the action is over at that point. But there's a key idiom in there and this call response happens very close to the user. If you send me a request, I might send you an answer right away, but then defer some work and have her do some work later. As we move away from the user, that deferred work, that streaming idiom, becomes more and more important. And that's where, of course, Flink and systems like it begin to play. But there's still some questions about how that should be done. People talk about how this was done in, in the 90s, and it didn't take off. It didn't work the way it does now. One of the major reasons is that even though there are good theoretical bases for how to process streaming data, these have been known for some time, even though good implementations were not available, there's still more to come. If you have a sender and a receiver of messages like this, and if the sender wants to send a message, then if we really, really want sender and receiver to be independent and opaque, the receiver must have the freedom to run intermittently. This is the key 
for how streaming systems can take over the batch workload in the world is by running intermittently. They still are streaming, they just aren't always present. And if that second process, the receiver, is not running at any given moment, then the sender may also decide to run intermittently. And both of those are independent implementation decisions. But then when the receiver comes back, it needs to get that message. And the message has to have been somewhere. It has to have been in a persistent channel. A special case of this is when the receiver has not even been implemented at the time the message is sent. We still want to receive those messages because whether or not you've finished the job yet is an implementation detail to the sender. So we need persistence in the queues. We need performance, performance so extreme that we cannot touch the edges. And this combination of persistence and performance has never been possible before. So the second aspect of the revolution is that this microservices, the things that enable this kind of streaming computation, things that enable that first revolution of extracting value from the scale of data, must have proper transport, and they must be able to use them well. Old school systems just couldn't do this. Now, it's also very, very different. How you process that data is not at all like a batch Turing style. Here's finite input, here's a program. A finite time later, you produce a finite amount of data. Instead, data is, input data is unbounded on one side. I mean, there's a beginning of time, but there is no notional end of time. The output that it produces is likewise unbounded, and furthermore, it must be allowed to produce provisional outputs. And of course, producing provisional outputs after some level of detail means we have to handle provisional and unordered inputs. These are, of course, key characteristics of technical characteristics of Flink. So, our latency, of course, is not the only story. There's the fundamental physical problem with computation. If we take a traditional view of computation, a traditional view of sharing databases, if you and I want to share a database, then we have to agree on what now means, because we have to commit things to that database in a single moment. But this is how big a nanosecond is, and that's how big and instruction is in terms of time of flight of light. And so between me and you are hundreds, perhaps thousands of instruction times. And to do a database transaction, I have to send a message, I have to receive a message, I have to send a message, receive a message, and send a message, and receive a message. So we're talking about thousands of times slow down. On the other hand, we can agree on before and after without that cost. You may not have seen my messages yet, but I can guarantee that they appear to you in order or with an original time on them. So we can agree about that. So delay and flow are the fundamental concepts of how we need to think about it. Think about right now the temperature of the Earth to the millisecond. We know it's pretty warm in this theater, but we don't know what the temperature is in San Francisco or Tokyo, not within a millisecond, because light only goes 300 kilometers in a millisecond. In fact, there will not be an official time in San Francisco until about a month from now when everybody has checked the data and so on. But we get provisional data now. We can estimate what the temperature is now based on the provisional data we got an hour ago. So the idea of now that a temperature somewhere else exists is implausible, but the idea of provisional data that flows to us is a very natural way to view the physics of the universe. And that's a very, very important and necessary lesson that we have for computing, and it's not just temperature, it's all things that derive from the physical world. We have to write programs now in terms of flows. Essentially, all important programs cannot be solved at the speed 
that our computers can now do, and the speed is stunning. Remember, this is as fast as a Cray-1, which once upon a time was a supercomputer. It's now an antique. This is what we need to do. We really need to write programs in terms of flow. Now, if we try to do things in the real world, if we look forward to how we can do these things with flow-based computing, we can look here at a proposed system for a financial client that we're delivering soon. And the idea, never mind, that's just too big. Talk about big data. Uh, the idea that we can receive data in a queue and then just simply spread it out into other queues keyed by the topic name itself and use that key for essentially all of the queries that we need to do to the data means that we can eliminate the database from certain major applications. That means that for a few nodes, four or five, we can handle millions of transactions per second, orders of magnitude faster than any sort of database works now. This has major implications for the complexity of how we build things, looking forward, that is. But if we look back to how we wanted to implement systems, this is a diagram that's a simplification of a diagram that I drew 10 years ago about a system we wanted to build. And it's all processing blocks and arrows. And I know many, many people who draw pictures of the systems they want to build this way and have for a long time. But until recently, we couldn't build them that way. If we take just part of it, this upload part, the way we want to build that, wanted, times ago, is with real streams in between the blocks. Now, we might want nowadays just to label the arrows, but the fact is we have wanted for a very long time, there's been a, a latent demand to build systems even though they were built then as batch, we wanted to build them as streams. Systems like Uzi and other workflow systems are symptoms of trying to build streaming systems on top of batch primitives. So the real world implication here is that with the right transport, with the right kind of processing, we can build extraordinary systems. What's happening right now is very comparable to the relational rewrite, to the internet rewrite, and now the flow-based computing rewrite of nearly all the software in businesses. And so the title of this talk was How We Take Flink Forward. And so the question then is, where does this go from here? We need to think about some of these questions. What's going to be the effect on business in general when we can actually listen to our customers? Listen to what they want. Listen to what they tell us in the moment. How is that going to change business? I think it's going to, in many cases, make it much more personal. I used to go to a cafe. I would tend to order the same thing. The lady who owned it would see me in line and just nod to me. I would nod back. By the time I got to the front of the line, where everybody else was ordering, she would deliver my food. That's an example of how listening to customers can make it better. We have a very strange situation and inversion right now. We're willing to pay people to listen to us. We're willing to pay Amazon to listen to us and provide a better experience. We're willing to pay Netflix to listen to us and provide a better experience. Do we really want that sort of economic inversion? Is that going to lead to strange things? Will it lead just to a cuddly internet, or will it lead to some very strange things? And a much bigger question, not just because it's bigger type, the question for everybody here is, will Flink be at the core of that revolution? Flink is poised to be there. Flink could be the core of this revolution, or not. It is entirely optional to fail. I've proved that a couple times in my life. It really depends on everybody here in this room. Everybody here can drive adoption. The lessons are that Flink really has been built for the future of computing, has been built for the third major revolution in electronic computing, 
in one of the 10 major revolutions in information processing in the last 10,000 years. It's right at the core, it's right in the heart of what's happening right now in these terms. But what Flink got, what got Flink here is not going to be enough to get it there. To make Flink really the core there is not going to be adding technical capabilities like what got it to this point. What we need now is large-scale production and adoption of this system. That is the thing that will drive Flink forward as the tool. As I mentioned, Ellen and Costas have written a book. We have another older book about streaming architecture available over at the, the very red MAPAR booth. And there's a bunch of other books that you can get online. And what I'd like to do now is spend 10 minutes. Uh, Ellen didn't believe that this was going to be 30 minutes, but it was. So I'd like to first say thank you for coming, and I'd like to engage with people here, ask you to ask questions, inspire the audience, challenge the audience, piss somebody off by claiming that they're not doing enough. Uh, let's have a discussion here. Now, it's going to be difficult, so you're going to have to wave your hands quite dramatically, and we'll try to get you a microphone. Is there anybody? Yeah, there's something happening in the back. Are you just waving? This is like an auction, you realize. If you move, if you move a hand toward your face, you're going to be required to ask a question. Commentary is acceptable, too. Come now, people. Okay, I'm going to volunteer Costas to comment on this. Is this how you see it, Costas? So He's still wiggling. <laughs> So what is the advice that you would give here in the audience? How can they help? How can everybody help Flink? I think that we need to very much listen to the people who are about to use it, could use it, and listen to the things, the very small things in many cases, that are limiting adoption. There's two kinds of things that limit adoption. The silly stuff that people prevent people from considering it, and the substantial things to prevent them from fully adopting it. The silly stuff are often the requirements that they uh, put in ahead of time. And the substantial things are often requirements that are imposed on them. Things like security, safety, multi-tenancy. Uh, they tend to be the boring things. We're gonna have to do a bunch of boring stuff. Yeah. Ted, I already asked you this question a couple of months ago at when we had the meetup of Apache Flink in London. And I just want to see if your answer see if has I'm changed consistent. a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, so you're standing here in, in sort of two capacities. One is working for a commercial Hadoop distributor and one as a representative of the Apache Software Foundation in some sense, right? And, yeah, well, uh, and a third one, which <laughs> is me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so the question I asked you then roughly was what role, actually I think I may have asked, um, you know, when is MapR going to support Flink? And the answer you gave, roughly speaking, was when our customers need it. Um, but perhaps I can now rephrase my question and say, so what role could MapR play perhaps as, as a you know, sort of enterprise-facing uh, company that has, you know, uh, professionals that are usually in high esteem with companies and that are reassuring towards the company. You know, when a company says, oh, we don't know whether this open source stuff is going to be secure enough and whether it's going to work, having a company like MapR, you know, some system engineers, et cetera, reassure them and say, you know, we've, we've tested this. We are very confident that this technology is the future. You know, you, you can use it, we're going to help you, etc. So what role can MapR play in that? So there's a couple of aspects to that. And I'll talk about what we could do. But I'm also going to talk about the larger stage and what might happen if we don't. So one of the things we can do is just provide a single point of contact. I've had, during this conference, a couple people say, we would love to put Fling into production, but we're not going to deal with a different 
vendor for every piece of software that we have. We want to focus that down. So purely by point being a point of transaction, uh, not entirely regardless, but who actually does the work there, whether you know the money gets passed along to data artisans or supporting the community or you know hiring developers who can participate in the community, that's a much less important consideration than they have one phone number to call. So that's one thing we can do is just focus that where we have large adoption and we have you know, uh, th over a thousand customers in enterprises, we can provide that focal transactional position. Uh, the other thing that happens though, and this is more the stage setting, is right now bets have been laid to some degree on systems competitive to Flink. Other major players are pushing other systems. Now I think they're they're missing the bus a little bit in some of the capabilities that they're not getting. But that leaves MAPR in a position to be kind of the big player who could politically adopt Flink as, as a supported entity. And so I think that there would be, I don't know quite a nice way to say it, but there would be some aura of credibility that would rub off from a major endorsement like that. Now, to some degree, that's a valid inference by customers. To some degree, it's just faddishness. But I think it would have a real effect. So those are two things that we could do. But we're also very conservative about that. And we, I've been very, very happy to gather stories, and I would love to gather more from potential customers where if we made a decision a certain way, that would make a difference to them adopting for production use. So that would be the, the key step for us. It's because we follow our customers as much as lead them. And their voice is louder than mine. Ellen seems to think she wants to say something. Other so, than that, she has an itch. No, so I'll stick my, my neck in a, in a noose here, sitting somewhere between MAPAR and Flink. So I. I consult for MAPR. I'm a huge enthusiast for Flink. Um, one of the things... You didn't see yesterday. She was wearing socks with squirrels on them. I had squirrel socks on so, yesterday, I mean, and nobody even noticed. How many people here had okay. squirrel socks on? Not, nobody. That's yeah, see. the only one. So I just want to say one of the things that really impresses me is that Flink really has been built for the future. That doesn't mean don't be very... Uh, aware of customer needs now. We need to get adoption now, and what do people need to you know, bridge that gap from where they are to understand using streaming in general to see that Flink is a great solution and you know, how much effort on their part, how much effort on the community's part, and so forth uh, to make that. But Flink is built for the future, and what I mean by that is it's not just reactive to the way people have done things and kind of fill in a gap, is I think it's designed to do what computing needs to do as people move forward in this revolution, and I think that's beautiful. It's part of why I like this project. MAPAR is built for the future. It was engineered from day one to be a production ready, let's go forward and what people are going to want to do moving forward. And so I really like that combination. MAPAR has MAPAR streams, which is really good for transport. I mean, there's, it's a nice combination. So speaking as individual, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I think that it would be very exciting to see what people could build on that. But it goes back to a larger question, uh, you know, what could MAPR do to support that? That would be great. I'd love to see it. What can the larger community do? Uh, companies who are interested in using Flink just be more vocal about that so everybody sees that there's an interest. I think that can contribute. And then all of you are doing a beautiful job of, of kind of raising interest and in getting the word out uh, through meetings, papers, books, whatever, this conference to say that there is a worldwide interest in this project. But, Ellen, I think it's time to get serious and put these things in production, not just experiment, but to go forward and be serious about it. We're very close to the end here. I think there might be a hand back there. Wave, wave it vigorously. Yes, there is a hand all the way in the back. Come on down and we'll give you a mic. All right, so just before this happens, so I think if you look at how the production deployments of Flink developed over the last year, 
you can definitely see a trend. And we are Thank now, God it's positive. It's, it's more than positive, right? It's plus plus. And, and we see like extremely large scale deployments being done right now. And what I think is really good about this community is that these users and the main committers of the project are really one community. So they're really working together. The, the feedback that the project is getting from uh, these large scale installations is largely what, what drives its development. My question is... Let me show this is a proof of existence. People in the back can ask questions. Um, so uh, I apologize if I botch history, which you brought up some really great examples. But I guess for accounting and the internet, they're maybe spurred by technology, but seem to be stories of the network effect of standards. Um, do you see, like sort of accounting and whatever web standards as sort of interchange that become valuable because people are using them. Um, do you see anything, like what do you see as playing that role in this flow-based So um, you're right that standards, although I think informal standards have more power sure. than formal ones, standards make a huge difference. One example that I like to use is that if you take value, economic value, market value of companies as a proxy for success. Clearly not the same thing, but related. And you take the NoSQL world, you take the Hadoop big data world, to within one, maybe two significant figures, the value of the NoSQL marketplace is zero. What happened there, and, and then go back one step, look at the relational world, massive value much larger than the big data world still, although that may well change over the next few years. So what happened there is in the NoSQL world, there's no interoperability, none. It was not even conceptual interoperability. You have to re-architect, not just recode. In the Hadoop world, partly through explicit action, partly through back door, oh, that's not the product, but it's a different project, efforts on a lot of part a lot of people's parts and you know the the ones that i've been specifically involved in drill sp helping to spawn calcite drill helping to do apache arrow those will never be products and therefore they can be adopted very very widely that gives well and, and even flink i believe is adopting calcite that gives a common sql dialect across all the big data tools and that commonality, those informal standards, are critical to adoption. The perception that you have a choice, there's somebody to go to after one of the companies goes bust, which may well happen over the next six months or a year, uh, really makes it much easier to sell. It's much, much harder to make the case that an unknown NoSQL database is a worthy competitor of Oracle and HANA, Microsoft's SQL Server, because there is no other company that will work on it. But there are many companies in the big data space. So Apache Beam, for instance, is a ploy to get that commonality. And even more effective, I think, are the fact that the Kafka, or I'm sorry, the Flink types of APIs are being imitated by other projects. And so you get rough architectural equivalents. Those are the things I think that need to happen for this to be big. Basically agreeing with what you said in too many words. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I think it's time to cut it off. Uh, getting lots of hand signs. But I'll be happy to talk to anybody about these issues to the extent that I can talk at all uh, later today. Uh, let's discuss this. This is a, we've got a big day here, a lot of breaks, a lot of lunch, and a lot of talk to have. So thank you very much.